Without any further ado from me, I'm going to hand over to the General Secretary of the Socialist Party, Peter Taft. Well, Comrade Chair and Comrades, I thought Bob did very well in that introduction. In fact, I don't know whether I can really add very much to the outline that he's given. But he's, as he correctly said, in St Paul's yesterday, David Cameron made the statement, which contradicts, by the way, what he said on the eve of the last general election, that we're all Thatcherites now. That was a kind of imitation in an opposite sense of what Harold Macmillan said in the 1960s that we're all planners now because he recognised the gains that had been made on the welfare state. The conquests, if you like, from the pressure of the working class in Britain in establishing the welfare state in the immediate period after the Second World War. And that was an international process. Because in Britain you could say, due to the pressure of the working class and in particular of the generation that went through the Second World War in the 1930s, the determination was never to go back to those conditions of mass unemployment. And the pressure of the working class forced, really, right-wing Labour, wasn't a left Labour government in any sense of the term, to carry through a quarter of a revolution, to establish the National Health Service, to begin to nationalise the mines and other industries and keep, create the infrastructure, if you like, of what they called was a mixed economy. It was still capitalism, but they were forced to recognise the pressure and the gains of the working class. And when Cameron made that statement in St Paul's, it was not an accident at all. It was true, by the way, in relation to the ruling class. And let's be clear about this. That meeting in, in St Paul's, because that's what it was, of the representatives of capitalism was not just a funeral service for Thatcher but involved all the main political parties including the Labour Party, the Liberal Party, recognising, if you like, Thatcher's achievements in carrying through or attempted to carry through a counter-revolution against the rights and the conditions of the working class. And we can say, as Bob has indicated, that the intention was to use the funeral, was, which was long in planning, and again, let us remember here today, not just let it go, it's been mentioned in the press, that this Operation True Blue, as it was called, the main outlines were formulated under the Blair and the Brown government. They were not only complicit in the preparations for this funeral, of an estimated £10 million being made, they were the main instigators, and it was shown by the pictures of Tony Blair, that appeared in the Financial Times at the weekend that we're going to carry in the next issue of Socialism Today. And it was very clear that the ruling class and its representatives were using this funeral in order to give a signal they were going to exploit the death of Thatcher, reinforce her message which would in turn reinforce the policies of austerity and retrenchment that are being carried through at the present time. And the first thing we have to say the day after that funeral is they've completely miscalculated because it's blown up in the face of the government and all those who are looking towards this funeral. The, 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 the Guardian this morning said there was an estimated quarter of a million on the streets of London. I think that that is rubbish if you take the accounts of our own comrades who were down there who turned their backs on the funeral, who discussed with people and so on. And it was largely confined to the southeast. You had a divided uh, uh, country, not just in the southeast, in the centre of London is where it was expressed, and perhaps in the shires and so on. But as far as the rest of the country is concerned, it's absolutely incredible the level of visceral hatred that was reserved for a funeral after all. This is not the state opening of Parliament. This is not the election of a new government. This is a funeral for one individual. And why did the protest take place? It's obvious to us who are gathered here, gathered here today, but it's important to make these points. Number one, it reminded the older generation of what Thatcher did in the course of a whole reign, not just in the 1980s, but particularly from 1979 to 1991-92. And as Bob pointed out, I'll comment on that in a moment, that led to the growth of the militant 
and the Socialist Party is a factor in the situation in Britain and to some extent internationally at that stage. It reminded the older generation of what she did. And for the young people, when I went on the radio last week to BBC local radio for one and a half hours, I spoke to an estimated 10 million people in the same interview repeated endlessly to BBC London, BBC Merseyside, BBC Scotland and so on. The question that I got, well, we can understand people who suffered under the heel of Thatcher, but what about the young generation? They weren't even born when Thatcher uh, was in power. And I made the very simple point, but they are inheriting the conditions that Thatcher created and inevitably it's gone home to them that the conditions that they faced were not the conditions of previous generations, particularly in the long boom of 1950 to 1975, and they've begun to ask questions about how this situation has come about, and that's the beginning of the next phase when they will fight back as well. I made the point in an article in 2009, and I repeated it in a press release we made a week ago, where we said the only comparison one could make with the Thatcher regime was of Genghis Khan, like an army, a, a marauding army, that came across the landscape, landscape and left absolute devastation and the ruination of literally millions of workers' lives. Let's be clear about it, it was a civil war. To some extent, a one-sided civil war, because all the aggression came from the side of Thatcher, from the side of the state, from the side of their bully boys, and so on. And I remember an experience, everybody has an experience of the miners' strike. But I remember in the, in the Yorkshire village of Allerton by water, standing with a thousand miners, their wives and their children, and 1,500 police. It was the closest to a civil war you could see. And the weeping, and the sense, this was on the eve of the miners going back to work. It was about a month before, after I'd spoken at a meeting in Yorkshire. And tears came to my eyes, tears of rage, not just of reflecting what happened with the miners, but of what could have been. The idea that the miners' strike was doomed to defeat is absolute bunker. Martha Scargill, when he, 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 uh, about uh, two years ago, wrote an article in The Guardian and gave details of the way the negotiations had arrived at a stage where it was likely that the miners could have scored a victory. We can't blame Thatcher for the deeds that she's uh, done. I mean, she was a warrior for her class. It's not just because she was a hateful person that we were opposed, although she was. It's not because of the devastation that was wreaked, but she was a, a conscious representative of her class. She was a general on behalf of the ruling class. What about the generals on our side, or lack of generals, who refused to use the mass movements that took place and mobilized for victory in the course of that situation itself? And I use the example on radio that she was a dictator. She used dictatorial methods. And when I was interrupted by, because I had it all prepared, it was part of the script, inevitably you would get an interruption, but she won three elections. Said uh, in, inevitably, in four or five occasions, that's what the interviewer said. I said, yes, she won three or four elections, but let us listen to a very authoritative figure. John Stoker, who was the deputy chief constable in Manchester at the time, in the Daily Mirror, last week, a couple of days after she died, she took us to, to the brink of being a police state. And he gives the details of what happened with the police in relation to what she did. And then he said, well, she won elections. Yes, she won elections, but the comparison with her, I said it was ele an elected dictatorship. That was the phrase that Thatcher herself used in relation to other regimes. And what I mean by that is she was elected, on a number of occasions, but she didn't put forward their program in those elections. If you take trade union legislation, a very general outline of what she was intending was put forward prior to 1979. We've looked it up today, but that was in effect, if you're talking about a dictatorship, it takes away democratic rights. What is a, de what is a democracy if the working class, the main social force in society, do ha does not have the right to strike? And that has effectively been taken away from them by a whole series of legal 
obstacles that have been put in their path, which of course have reinforced the position of the right-wing trade union leaders, who also, behind the scenes, were not unwelcoming to these attacks on the trade unions, because it provided them with an excuse for not mobilising their own members for a struggle in this situation. She had no uh, authority and no mandate in the general elections, which she fought for the kind of policies that she carried, to, carried through. She had friends of every rotten dictatorship on the planet, John Reid is sitting here, who participated in the campaign. When Pinochet came to Britain, I've just written a part of a new book I'm doing on the second part of the history of militant or the Socialist Party as it is now. And in that you got, went through the conspiracy between Jack Straw, who was the Home Secretary of Labour, of Thatcher and the Thatcherites, who immediately came to the defence of Pinochet in relation to his threatened imprisonment and him being repatriated to Spain, where he would have stood, stood uh, in, in the court for, for crimes against humanity, specifically for torturing and murdering the flower of the Chilean working class during his regime. It wasn't just in, in relation to Pinochet. Look at last week's Observer, last Sunday's Observer, which gave a very clear picture of a conspiracy involved with Mark Thatcher and uh, this fellow man, Simon Mann, in relation to Equatorial Guinea. And Thatcher was fully behind this discussed with Mann. It's all detailed in this article. Went further than that and said that she, he, he, uh, if, if they carry through this successful coup in Equatorial Guinea, well, the next step should be overthrowing Hugo Chavez, which let's remember, despite all the talk about him being a dictator, was actually successfully elected democratically through a number of elections itself. And there's fresh evidence to, to see the role of Thatcher. She was one of those bourgeois politicians that if there was a threat, a fascist threat, would probably have collaborated with, the, with that against the democratic rights of the working class. That's the kind of woman that we're talking about. And then there was the shameful scapegoating. If you look at the BBC yesterday, and the media in general, it was an arm of capitalism like we haven't seen for a long time. It was an open representative of extolling the virtues of the funeral, even though probably a minority in Britain were actually supporting uh, what they were seeing on the television itself. And that's not an accident. Because, of course, at the head of the BBC now is Chris Patton, who we came out against in the, in the poll tax strike. He made the infamous statement when uh, we, we struggled in his constituency, he was in a kind of semi-rural area, and he said, well, the only people opposed to the poll tax were those militants in, uh, I think it was Slough at the time, which wasn't really consider considered to be a very militant part of Britain in relation to that. Even on Sunday, when Andrew Marr made a return to the programme that's named after him, he just let out in passing that in 1979, he was a young reporter, he was in Liverpool, and he could, he could give, uh, he could cross his heart and hope to die, but the councillors in Liverpool, at the time when the so-called, they weren't burying the dead, which is a lie and a myth, that Liverpool council then, it was a minority Labour council, were pa planning to drop the, the dead into the sea as a means of solving their problem. It was just passed, just like that. No comment, just accepted. It's an out outright lie, and it's a slander, of course, against the working class of Liverpool itself. It wasn't an accident that two sets of fans, one at Reading and one at Arsenal the other night, where the Everton fans had a banner, and they were, it wasn't in Liverpool, it was outside of Liverpool, in which they had a banner and they said, Thatcher, rot in hell. And the Liverpool fans said, I think it said something like, you, uh, when you, you told lies when you were alive, we don't, be, we don't believe you when you're dead. Anyway, it rhymed. I forget exactly the actual uh, jingle that it represented. All of that is an indication of the, the hatred and the horror that has been built up in and around this funeral, which is symptomatic both of the 1980s, but more importantly, is a symptom of the situation today that is not expressed yet in open movements of working class people, but will be in the period that we're actually going